Welcome to our ComposeCast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I am doing well. The glare has never been worse over here, though. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. I don't know what it is, but something is going on with the glare in my glasses. I I am not going to be able to edit that out of the video promo. It's it's not going to be good. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> we'll, we'll deal with it for now. I know you got your glasses on over there too. <laughs> so hopefully hopefully not for long. Uh, I have been putting off calling LASIK, but it's one of the things on my uh, Kanban board uh, to awesome. yeah. to to get that done. I actually have a, a place selected out. I just got to call them and and haggle about the price. You know. Just, <laughs> haggling about someone putting a laser in your eye <laughs> i'm not going cheap but you know still anything i can anything i can get man i gotta tell you i really i really went down hard on monday and uh i, I i've i've never been happier about working from home i i think i was telling you i wasn't feeling so hot and uh and and, and monday i woke up for work and stayed there about about three or four hours and just told my told my manager i'm like look i'm i'm out you know i'd I'm I'm gonna go yeah. take a nap, and I slept for like four hours. Uh, it's four and a half hours straight. I was like, I I felt so much better, and not being at the office meant that I wasn't pressured. I think to to stick around, right, or or to push yeah. through, or to pretend everything was normal. I you know I was I was at home. I I, I was in a situation where I could judge a little bit more accurately how, how I felt about myself. Like I was, I was, I, I know what I usually feel like when I get up and, and come downstairs in the morning. I was like, this is not normal for me. So I was able to call it pretty early and react to it as, as, as soon as I, I could and, and really kind of nurse it through. I mean, it, it took two days and, and a lot of soup, but uh, I, I am feeling 1000% better. So I'm, I'm happy about that. Yeah. Yeah. I I took two days off of uh, lifting and everything. I, I I think it was a long day on Sunday, that led me to uh, just skip yesterday and Monday on just exercise altogether. I don't I wasn't I just wasn't feeling well. I don't know what it was, but how about you? You you took took a couple hours off of work, just judged it, judged it how you felt, and just rested. Yeah, that was that was really cool. So uh, one one of the unintended benefits of, of working from home, you know, is, is just that ability to, to make those kind of judgment calls and, and feeling a lot less pressure uh, on myself to, to kind of power through something. So, Oh yeah, definitely. And especially being at the office, you're just going to sit there and be miserable for the next four hours. So anyways, let's, uh, let's go ahead and dive into the show here. Uh, I wanted to bring up Frontman before we dove into anything else. This is something that I saw had released into alpha right after the the show had recorded last episode, uh, which is, Frontman is a static sites generator written in Ruby, uh, optimized nice. for speed. It I, I figured you would appreciate that that Ruby. Okay, all right. So uh, well, <laughs> the the tagline is that it helps you convert your content to static HTML files, so you can focus on your content instead of maintaining servers. That's kind of what we were going over with the static site generators. And I was just happy to see that release of, of Frontman. They said they had forked it off of another project. Yeah, I'm looking at Middleman, which is another static site generator. How how about that? Generating it for speed. That, that's interesting because usually when you have any kind of backend like that, I, I think of that middle lot that uh, application logic. That everything has to deal with, but this one is a is this still a static site generator? Yes, it's not Rails. It's it's Ruby. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, it, it it is generating static HTML like Jekyll would, and I, I I think it's going for the same kind of demographic, forking off a of middleman because it thinks it can do things a little bit better, and that's really the beauty of open source. So definitely a project to watch uh, going forward. I just wanted to give it uh, a fair mention. Okay, so a question for you. What, sure. What static site is static site is static site? What is speed? What's going to be the difference in speed? What's that? I mean, I feel like for Jekyll, for us, building a site, shoot, it might take a couple minutes max. What, what are they even, doing? Sh shaving down at three minutes? I mean, I, I, I guess that would be the, the claim to fame. They're, they're trying to shave off however long it would take to generate it. And especially if you use different languages like 
Go, which are provably faster yeah. right, than, yep. than than other higher level languages, um, or or just optimizing different legacy code bases obviously account for a lot of the latency and, and slowness and, and just you know you have to walk through all of the logic that was there that was that was kind of uh, kept around for the past couple of years so in there, yeah. being able to to get rid of that or or taking steps on a forked project that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do on the main project and and that is also another uh, appeal for forks you can kind of make the analogy to startups versus big corporate businesses, right? Where, where startups are able to innovate, they're able to be more agile uh, because they don't have as much baggage behind them or, or responsibilities or, or kind of right. momentum that the large corporations or, or large businesses would. Um, but the, the flip side to that is that the, the large businesses are then forced to innovate to keep up with those or absorb them and, and with that, adopt their other new business practices new practice. yeah yep. or or, or kind of i mean you take a look at what uh ibm did with red hat right so they they absorbed red hat but kept red hat as a separate quote-unquote entity within the ibm ecosystem and said look we know what you're doing is working we would like to learn from you rather than enforce what we have and what it, frankly has not been working on them so I, I, I think it's it's very interesting how, how forks work in the open source ecosystem and we can certainly get into that some other day I would I would love to dive in there. Um, I also wanted to touch on uh, memberful being everywhere. So I <laughs> <laughs> definitely yeah, let's jump into this one because I was looking at the uh, what is it bad Meinhof phenomenon. That's the, I, I'm getting ready to buy a car here and I'm thinking I think I'm, I'm looking at trucks. All I see around me is trucks now and I'm like <laughs> yeah you this strike is... me as a truck guy you could you, you could pull it off <laughs> yeah so yeah well, what do you see in memorable memorable everywhere now is that oh what? yeah yeah so so besides Jupiter broadcasting there were two or three other shows where i had stumbled across their their donations page and sure enough it redirected right to memberful and powered, powered by yeah having just talked about it the episode before the uh the bader meinhof phenomenon uh, states that once you become aware of something, you be, you end up seeing it all over the place. And and your example, I think that you were leaning towards was if you buy a car or start looking at cars or know a buddy who who bought a specific type of car, you start seeing that car everywhere because oh, you yeah. suddenly become oh, yeah. aware of it. I think that was the example linked in the article is why I said it also. Now, the interesting thing is that I had just become aware of the Bader-Meinhof phenomenon, and then I started associating the Bader-Meinhof phenomenon with everything I saw. Is that meta? Maybe a little bit. Bader-Meinhof-ception. <laughs> Either way, I, I just I just thought it was interesting. I'm, I'm very happy to see Memberful picking up steam, um, and... And uh, I, I think it offers a great service, uh, as we were talking about last episode. But no need to rehash old news. Uh, let's jump into new news. And actually, no news is good news. And we have good news today. We have no news. That's uh, external for the external for us. I guess that's around uh, the community, is what I'd say. That's not internal. We have we have updates, but we don't have any uh, no no community news over here. <laughs> and a little bit into our process as well. We curated the listing of the open source projects that we use we we've curated their upstream release notes and and uh, announcements in our bookstack instance right so uh, it, to to peek behind the curtain here uh, before every episode i go through those and check to see if there are any announcements specifically on those applications. Um, I didn't see any there or really any news that was newsworthy for us today, uh, but we did have a couple art composed developments, right? So, so Jack, if you wanted to start off jumping into those. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, with the art composed cast, we have a couple updates. We have our dark mode, which are shipping out this weekend. I'm pretty excited about it. Now watch out on light mode. We're working on a fix right now, but if you set light mode on a page, it's only going to stick for that page. Do you, do you think that'll still be the case by the time this comes out? By Sunday? No, I'm hoping not. But okay. that, that's okay. Uh, getting into local storage here and saving 
cookies and all types of fun stuff. But uh, hopefully that that should be fixed. I, we expect that to be fixed. Bye. I, I, I really have to thank you, Jack, for taking one for the team, for dealing with this front end stuff. <laughs> oh, man. oh, man. That JavaScript is a beast. <laughs> especially just jumping feet first into it but hey yep. it, it's fun it's a challenge and the site looks good i'll tell you that it looks really good yes also with the r compose cast i'm gonna jump in here we have r com is live so r com uh went live uh it, it is simply a, a redirect to the jekyll site on r com. you can still get to there with the original url it is just a, a convenience redirect uh for us and i i Put in stuff so we can do more of that in the future. Probably more eas- easier to share. Uh, I would hope. Yeah, that that base link makes it so much easier rather than saying to someone go to a uh, subdirectory or a, you know a, a folder of an nginx file. So I'm I'm really happy about that. That's just not been normalized, and and I think uh, having arcomposecast.com to redirect people to uh, is is just going to be simpler. Now, along with that comes our YouTube channel, which w- uh, went up last uh, Wednesday, I believe, or last Tuesday. So that is, for the time being, going to be a clip channel. So so like promo clips, and uh, we're also going to be starting to put up promotional materials for our compose the technology itself not simply for the podcast uh, so if you do have some questions you know hopefully we can have a couple of videos that can address some of the the getting started and the, the what we do and about us so we are we are going to start populating those in the next in the upcoming several weeks uh, but for the time being hopefully for every podcast that goes out uh, we put out a little promo clip um, to share and to to get the word out. Uh, feel free to give us some feedback if if that goes over well or if that you know if if, if there's something that can be improved uh, we have turned off comments on those videos uh, if you want to talk with us either you know contact us through one of our contact pages or through locals.com uh, we do have those communities set up we've we're, we're, we're not going through YouTube for for interaction so. yeah so locals.com all right. Um, And then something I was able to put into place recently. Uh, Now, this isn't in a a stable release yet that is going to be forthcoming, but health checks uh, have been integrated into all of our services, right? So this is part one of our three or four step monitoring plan. Um, The the cool thing about Docker is that it can run its own health checks on a schedule. So basically we have every 30 seconds or so given the service, we have the, uh, the Docker daemon pinging the container and running several different health checks, availability checks, just to make sure the site is accessible and, and available uh, to whoever were to, to ping it. Now it doesn't test any of the integrity uh, or, or responsiveness or, or measure really any metrics. It is just simply telling us whether the service is up or not. Um, and we plan to put a little bit of uh, maintenance automation around that. Uh, just, just some really cool stuff we're looking into. So anyone who uses this tech will have it built in, uh, these these health checks. Now, the, the one thing I did find is that this can go in the Docker file and be distributed with the image itself, or it can be added later on with the Docker Compose service. That's the way we've implemented many of them, but specifically Bitwarden had a health check already built in. So that makes it super easy for me. I don't have to do literally a thing. It just simply checks it and automatically registers its own health. I can change if I need to the frequency uh, or the, the retries of it. But for the time being, it's it's working just fine for me. Yeah, I saw that. Well, we looked at it on uh, this past week, and I was really excited about it when you showed me it. Some of the scripts you had in place for checking yes. whether assets were there or not, and then uh, whether the service is getting you know any kind of response back. And I think uh, what I really my favorite was definitely that you said, "Oh yeah, I think health checks are broken." I ran a health check, and it came back, and the script came back as failed. And then I looked at the site, and it was actually broken add one you know plus one for health checks so I, i'm i'm super happy about them the plan is i guess is to make sure these services are up and running and we're alerted for when they're not yeah because i can't i can't be at my computer constantly checking these or you know i, I mean right. you know, a, a oh, dashboard yeah. is only useful if you have it in front of your face 24 7 right 
Um, right. Otherwise, I'm going to need some kind of alerting to, to let us know, you know, where where these are going. And I, I think that's what we're trying to jump to as well. And this is this is the first part of, of that specific implementation. Yeah, so definitely excited about that. Yeah. Huge, huge development. So uh, with that, uh, we are going to roll, I believe, right into our integration discussion. <laughs> yep. I think we're going to talk about Firefly 3, everyone's favorite software, personal budgeting software. So uh, this we're going to give the overview of it and some of the features, some of what's not there. And really, for me at least, I think we're going to be going into budgeting and zero-based budgeting. Um, yeah, so with Firefly 3, it's a way to track and manage personal finances. It can help you keep track of expenses and income so you can spend less and save more. I absolutely know I am guilty of just making one-off purchases at random for, for multiple things, like just random purchases. Not I haven't budgeted them for them. I haven't done anything for them. I'm just like, yep, I need this right now. It's kind of like it's just a fun purchase as a one-off, but then I'm, I'm looking at myself going, why, what, what, <laughs> why did you do this? You didn't have this categorized anywhere. What was the need for this? Looking back at it, like, what have I done? <laughs> what, why have I done this? <laughs> uh, but Firefly Theory is a way to help kind of manage that and help you budget accordingly. So with it, uh, I wasn't really impressed with the features, to be completely honest, I feel like any kind of personal budgeting software out there allows you to create transactions, accounts, uh, create budgets, categories, and tags. Uh, it's a, you can automate part of this with reoccurring transactions and auto budgets, and you can keep track of liabilities. Honestly, to me, that just sounds like accounting software in a nutshell. But one thing I do like about Firefly 3 is its UI. Mm. I'm very impressed with it. I, it's open source. So you can fork it, check it out, do whatever you want with it. But I love their UI. Um, granted, it doesn't plug in with a lot of services. You are able to use it to track everything. Some of the main features, it has double entry accounting, ability to manage different types of accounts. It has budgets. The one feature I really liked was piggy banks. So save yeah. up for everything. Because you were, you were telling me earlier that those stood out to you. So what do you... Oh, that was like the one feature I was like very impressed with. Uh, for me, it's very, I hate to even say that, but personal budgeting software is kind of underwhelming. Maybe it's just because I do all mine through GNU Cash. Granted, for budgeting, it, it, budgeting is different, a little different than accounting, but um, these piggy banks just stood out to me. So kind of getting into zero-based budgeting, it's the way this guy's methodology kind of states his documentation is uh, Start with your income. So whenever you get paid on whatever cycle, so if you get paid, you know, once every two weeks, once a month, take your income and then all your expenses, and then assign basically assign everything else past that into uh, pools. I don't I don't know if you want to call that or envelopes. Like the envelope method is a similar method. Um, basically, assigning all your money is gonna boil down to zero. You're gonna hit zero. Whether it's being saved, that means it's being saved. Whether it's being put in a piggy bank which is saving for something or whether it's you know going to rent or a car payment or whatever what groceries whatever their expense but these piggy banks stood out to me i'd call it a special way to save as what the way i think about it so instead of just saving up and saying oh well this is what i have and this is my you know my savings is already there you can allocate the money specifically towards a certain goal and then once you hit that goal you can hit it so like recently I bought a pair of roller skates. I definitely put that as a piggy bank item because there is no, that's not a normal expense. You know, you know, no one's going to be out there just buying rollerblades once a month or something crazy like that. It's, it's a one-off purchase that just kind of comes and it was something I saved up for and just bought on, kind of bought on a whim, but I was looking for it. So, uh, that's the one feature that stood out to me. I'm, I was excited about it. Uh, predicting and anticipating bills. I think, the one thing that a lot of budgeting software doesn't do correctly is this because it's a hard thing to understand because with uh, Mint and uh, YNAB, you need a budget. YNAB kind of explained that it helped forecast or do pr future predictions, but with Mint especially, it's very past oriented. It's this is what I've spent last month. This is what I made last month. It's very... It's past oriented with uh, Firefly 3 and some of this other software out there. You're able to say, OK, this is what I had last month. This is what it looks like. This is what we have allocated for next month. 
this is this is going to allow me to kind of predict and understand you know where i'm going to be in a month from now two months from now three months from now um obviously it isn't gonna forecast like a random expense but it'll give you a general idea of where you're going to be some of the missing features in it there's no stock portfolio but i like how in their documentation they actually link a portfolio management tool that's out there and i was checking it out and it's in it's a german developer so all their documentation is german which is kind of interesting if you need a portfolio manager it's there it's not included in firefly 3 by any means but uh he, I, I like how he linked to one it doesn't do business finances which it's it's a personal budgeting software i really wouldn't expect it to do uh business related functions yeah, that that was a point I wanted to make here. So your your first two missing features here is that you know it's, it doesn't have a stock management or, or portfolio management, and yeah. it doesn't have any business finances, small business accounting, or payroll management, which makes sense for a personal budgeting software. Yeah, exactly, and that's what it is. And it's as much as I've been, you know, kind of harping on some of the negatives. I like it because it's per it's a personal finance software. It's a but it's a budget. At the end of the day, it's a budget. Everyone has their way of budgeting. Yeah, you know, you're you're right. It's it's I mean, it's personal budget and and like you were saying before, I mean it it tends towards that direction where it pushes you more towards looking towards the future rather than dwelling on, you know, what happened last month or last year. Which is I really I do like that. I really like that you're able to say what what can I expect in a month? What can I expect in a year? What's going to happen around Christmas time? You're able to get like you're able to see patterns. So, a question for you: Do you know if this has uh, like emergency accounts where you can you can squirrel stuff away? I believe so. I'd have okay. to check right now, but I I, I, I want to say yes. Where you can just because everything gets assigned at the it's it's everything by the end of the month is sp- supposed to be assigned, whether it's savings account or an emergency savings account. Now I don't know if he labels it as an emergency as. I don't know if you can label it as emergency, but I, w- I, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, you can name these accounts whatever you want, I'm sure. Sure. So yeah. I think that's up to you. I think that's up to you whether or, want, whether or not you, you're going to decide if you want to put an, money in an emergency account or a rainy day fund. I, I so do, and I have because it's, yeah. it's yeah, really absolutely. important. You have, you have to. <laughs> you have to. Absolutely. Yeah, so it's a, it's a budget. At the end of the day, it's tracking income and expenses. At least that's how I view it. And managing, okay, I have, after my expenses, I have X number of dollars to spend. Where can I spend these and where have I spent these? And yeah. that's that's kind of what sets, I, I like the Firefly 3, mostly that's what sets it apart is it, it does help you say, okay, you know, usually we spend 100 bucks on groceries a month. It, it looks like next month you're going to spend about the same because the past four months you've done you know, within 90 to 100 every month. That point exactly, yes. Because without a budget, there's no way to go back and look and say, well, we've spent $100 on groceries for the past month, right? right. Or for, the, for the past six months, say. Every month for the past six months. That's way undervaluing it. Just because I'm sure. a cheapskate doesn't mean everyone else is. But <laughs> what, what you can do is you can say, look, this is, this is what I've set aside for this month and then if i'm not mistaken the next month there's actually some kind of carryover or something how, how does that work do you i think the carryover i know you're talking about I, I don't know if that's a firefly 3 feature but i've seen it where you can carry over funds from month to month if you say you have a you know clothing expense uh, clothing account and you spend you know 40 bucks a month and you allocated 100 that you have 60 for the next month to spend I remember going over this before, but they have a concept called rollover. Uh, in the documentation, it's in the budget section. Um, so they, they talk about rollover budgets can be used to, quote unquote, save up money in a budget. Uh, and they said that automatically Fire 5 3 will take the budget left from the previous period and add the configured amount to the budget. So it, it will keep on rolling over as you go. So what firefly 3 i think expects you to do is to constantly be tweaking how much you're you're allocating now 
that comes in handy in the sense that all right, if I if I did allocate a hundred dollars, it's probably more like four hundred for sure, yeah. per month for for groceries. If I allocated four hundred per month for groceries. For the first month, if I spend three eighty, then I would have four twenty allocated in for the next for the next for month, month too. Yeah, exactly. Now month three, if I also spent three eighty for the second month, so three eighty for the first month, three eighty for the second month, then I would have four forty allocated for the third month. Now, say something happens and I'm hosting like a a big picnic or something, I gotta I gotta spend a little bit more on on groceries. You know, pick up hamburgers and buns and and chips and whatnot right that's that's gonna make a dent in my grocery budget but because the last couple of months I've already budgeted I've, I've, I've been under budget right it allows me to guilt-free go over budget this month and still kind of maintain a status quo right and and honestly I, I do the same thing with calorie counting too I I overspend you know or, or you know I have too much I'm like oh man I oh I'm, I'm that's not like me, right? <laughs> you know, I'm like, that's that's not like me, and and uh, and I, I I go back and look at it though, you know, documenting it out, actually laying it out. It's like, well, okay, that wasn't that wasn't so bad, right? It's it's okay to, to splurge every once in a while, and and this kind of reinforces that with this this rollover functionality. Yeah, uh, question for you: what What do you use to uh, track calories? Do you use pen and paper, or what do you use uh, an app or anything? Or I use a pen and paper because I take the same approach that like. What's her face took on Harry Potter, where where she just like wanted him to feel pain when he wrote stuff, so it, like showed up on his hand, right? <laughs> I just like want this to be as painful for me as possible to understand calories because honestly, before I started tracking, I was I was probably having twenty eight to thirty two hundred calories oh, a okay. day. Okay, yeah. okay, and I was okay. like, no, this is I, I I did not understand just kind of a, a good estimation of what calories were, where, right? Where you were, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm usually I'm I'm writing them all out. I'm keeping track of uh, proteins because I definitely want to hit a, a certain target sure, there, uh, yeah. and and fats and carbs. So taking the taking those down uh, and then adding them up at the the end of the day and and kind of coming to a how about to that a total? How about that? Make it as painful as possible. You know what though that might that that can honestly help because it helps you realize. And I I'd go the same thing with a regular budget. It helps you, you know, if you have to sit down and track everything. I got, so I had Mint for a little bit and I used it for about a month. And I was like, yeah, I really don't have to enter anything into here. So I'm not going to bother looking at this. Uh, it's not, you know, something I need to look, not something I have to do. It. I don't have to work. I don't have to work to see the result. So I switched over and I just use, I use, I'm GNU Cash guy for all my personal accounting, you know, yeah. revenue, expenses, and double, double entry, the whole, the whole nine yards. But, that's how I do my budget now. And it is, I'll tell you what it is. I think making me do everything manually is a little bit painful, but it makes me understand, Hey, you're actually spending this much. We're doing, you're spent, you're in, you know, you're saving this much or making this much. So I, I, I do like how you brought up that manual kind of concept there. So I wanted to make sure that anything that we offer at our compose is going to be something that's going to fulfill a need. Right. And, yeah. and this I think fulfills oh, a need for, does. For, for budgeting, right? Especially for, for what you're talking about where you need you need kind of a visceral understanding of your budget as I need a visceral understanding of my caloric intake. Right. And and I think Firefly three is is the way to go for that. Uh, because for I think finance, absolutely your last missing feature here, well the one at least we haven't touched on yet, is that it doesn't have automated imports from uh, financial institutions. So what's that all yeah. about? So that's I'll tell you what that meant. That mint has that feature. I know they do. I don't know if you need a bank does as well, but it's that no automatic import from wherever, you know, wherever bank X bank. It, it does kind of hurt a little bit and it is a missing feature, but honestly, I think making it a little bit painful does help in the process. It helps you make it, it forces you to do it. It forces you to sit down, you know, once a month or once whenever you get paid. I usually do mine once a month. And say, all right, this is what came in. This what this is what went out, rather than having the automatic import and you know, loading in every transaction from the bank or the credit card and being like, oh well, looks like everything loaded. I guess I did okay this month. And looking at it for you know maybe two seconds before you're out the door. Well, okay, so so here's where we kind of lose the the calorie counting analogy because whenever I eat something, there's there's really no record of it being eaten, 
besides you know my my ever increasing uh, waist <laughs> size. But with with purchases, especially with with digital purchases, whether that be credit cards sure. or or sure. cryptocurrency or what have you, right? There's going to be a paper trail, right? Un- right. Unless you're buying stuff in in cash, right? You're going to be able to print out your statement from the past month, whether that be from checks or, like I said, credit cards or or crypto, right? You're going to be able to to kind of print that out or, or go back to it, and and wrap that up at the end of the month. Whereas for for me, if I I miss a couple of days on on jotting down what I what I had for dinner, I mean I'm it's I'm going to be hard pressed to go back and say uh. Pfft, Maybe it was six eggs. Maybe it was like three. Yeah, eggs. right. Yeah, I don't, I, I, right. I don't know. Yeah. So my my question with that elaborate lead up is, yeah, you know, what what do you think really is a loss here from not being able to automatically import those those kind of statements? Well, what's that? So you can skip out. I I think what you're getting at here are you trying to say you don't have to be held accountable for these missing purchases if you don't want to enter them in your own budget. I think the only per- I think at that example though you'd only be cheating yourself. Yeah. Because like you said, the paper trail is already there. Yeah, you don't have the excuse. Yeah, right. The paper trail is already there. You can go to the bank and say I want the transaction. I mean, you just have to ma- go in and manually load it in your budget, but if you refuse to enter something in cuz you're like, "Oh, well, I didn't actually mean to buy that." And then you bought it. I mean, the only person you're cheating is yourself when you look at your budget and you're like, I'm under by 200 bucks, but you know, you'd spent 350 on something that we were going for with that one. Definitely, definitely a part of it. I think that is important to call out too. you know, you, because there's no automated imports. I mean, you are putting these in manually, but you know, we're not all perfect by any stretch of the imagination. And there are months True. where, you know, I'm, I'm come the end of the month. I just get yeah. busy with one thing or another. And Whatever. I just, yeah. I just yeah. don't. Definitely. Right. With this, you can, there is no excuse. Yeah. There is no excuse not to go back. Right. You, you have the ability to go back and say, all right, well, I missed last month. Let me just pull my everything in and sit there, I guess for, you know, a couple extra hours and make sure it's all imported. Cause it, it's very easy. I, I will say it's very easy to get, once you're behind a month or two months, it's a hard game to play catch up. You really have to self motivate to sit sit down and say, "All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna do last month's finances and two months before that and the three months before that." But you know, if something like that happens, usually I do mine uh, within the first week, like between the first and the seventh for the month prior, because everything is usually done and cleared by the thirty first or whatever. So I just within that week, I'll make sure I've loaded everything in. If I were to get behind, I would. So if I was, if it was March and I hadn't done January or February, I would do January and February before I did March. So I'd sit down for, you know, if it took me two hours per time and I only want to sit down for four hours, I'd do January and February and just be like, well, I guess in April I'm doing March and April. Four hours is a lot of time to sit down though and, yeah. and import oh, that. Honestly, totally. I mean, that's. Totally. It, it wouldn't even take that. I mean, it wouldn't take that long, but. Well, and and part of the thing there is you have to be you have to be not even motivated. You have to be disciplined to do that. Yeah, yeah. Like you have to really care to sit down and do it. Yeah. And well, I and and I think it it pays off in the long run, obviously. But you have to have good reasons to start doing this so that you don't drop off in the first three months. Right. I don't know. I think everyone needs a budget. End of the day, if. You have to manage. I, I, you, I, I don't know how you can get away with not managing what comes in and what goes out. You can absolutely I, get away with it. I mean, oh, this- you totally can. There's no doubt. But I, I don't know why you would do. Why would you would put yourself in that position? Because, because I'm lazy. I mean, that- oh, boo. <laughs> Hypothetically, not actually. <laughs> but no, I, I, honestly, though, I mean, what what you're describing here does sound like a big time commitment, right? So what's what's the pitch for using this? No way. Four months at four hours out of the month. I, I don't know. I, I don't. The, I think the value it turns back is way more than what's put in, because you're able to see every month. You know what's a dollar worth to you, and you ask yourself, well, what do I value my time at? You say, oh, four hours. What you know, it comes out at X rate or whatever, X dollars. And it's like, oh, I sat down and it looks like I saved more than my four hours worth of time, plus an extra two hundred bucks or you know X number of dollars. And you're like, well, I'm glad I did this. 
because you, you're able to you're able to look back on the return for yourself essentially so the it's month, like the month the month return yeah it's like when i'm when i'm working in camboard i mean if if i wake up and and i'm just not feeling it that morning i can go back and see well you know in the past week i was able to get all these these things done right kind of feel that sense right. of accomplishment and purpose absolutely and that's yeah. i think that's kind of along the same same lines here it's that sense of accomplishment and sense of purpose to get to be able to look back and say yeah i i, I hit my budget and uh, you know, I have some more spending money next month or I have, I can do, go on the trip I wanted to go on. Yeah. You get certainty. Yeah. I think you get the certainty, but that's all, I've, that's all I've got. I'd, I'd definitely recommend it if you don't have a personal finance software or at least check it out. Yeah. I mean, have you, uh, I, I, I see the tagline here, uh, Firefly 3's method of personal finance. Uh, he says, uh, what Firefly Three has been built around how I manage my finances. Please read this carefully, so we match on how to do things. Which is great. This is the great open source community here. He uh, built this app for himself, so of course he just opened it, released it to the world. So if you if you do end up taking a look at his documentation and everything, you might be wondering where are these methods coming from. Oh, it's just from this guy's head. This is just how he did. This is how he basically assigned. You know everything in his head, and just kind of said, "This is how I want to lay it out. This is what works for me." At the end of the day, it falls under that zero-based budgeting scope. I, I, I think that's just what helps with that personal finance. I think that's a perfect way to do personal finances. Uh, yeah. So that was that's kind of the dream right there. That open source, you build it for yourself, you toss it out in the world. He, he built it. I guess everyone came. And now here he is. So this is Andrew's going to talk a little bit more about open source software, and this is about freedom. This section is about freedom right here. And I'll I'll try to do my best to go through this uh, without belaboring the point. But there there is a lot to say about the philosophy behind uh, free software. So I wanted to kind of codify it here and and s circle the wagons really around it so that we could get a really good understanding of where we're coming from with free and open source software. The first kind of quote I have here is, it, it, it's a subheader for this, this discussion, but it's putting the F in FLOSS. And, and to take a step back from that, FLOSS is an acronym uh, that stands for free and Libra open source software. So if you've heard our spiel before, you're probably familiar with the term open source software. The, the, the FLOSS acronym, I prefer to use because I think it does sum up all of what I want to say about the kind of software that we use, right? It is, it is free. It's free as in speech. It's free as in beer, right? It's, it's Libra, right? It, it has that kind of free speech connotation to it. It's open source. You can view, modify, et cetera, the source and it's software, right? I'm not talking about, you know, physical commodities. I'm, I'm just talking about software here. So I think FLOSS is the perfect, perfect acronym that I want to use going forward to describe what I'm passionate about, right? To, to describe the kind of software that we use here at Compositional Enterprises. So the first question you have to ask yourself is why freedom? Now, we all love freedom, uh, as does Fry and Zoidberg in our image of the week, if we're going to start doing that. I don't know if we are or not, but this week we do have one, uh, which is taken from their Freedom Day celebration episode uh with with them dancing on the table yelling freedom 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 oi freedom 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 oi <laughs> which is how i feel about freedom i don't know about you jack i i absolutely want to shout it from the rooftops let's dive into to to why it's so powerful if we take a look at one of the ideals or philosophies that that i would subscribe to uh would be voluntarism Right. And, and that is it's an ideology which its principal beliefs stem from two principles, uh, those being the principles of self-ownership and non-aggression. So the, the principle of self-ownership, also known as sovereignty of the individual or individual sovereignty, is the concept of property in one's own person, expressed as the moral or natural right of a person to have bodily integrity and be the exclusive controller of one's own body and life. Now, if I was being semantic and say, well, 
what do you have to do this weekend? You're like, oh, or, or next week, you're like, oh, well, I have to go to work. I'm like, well, no, you don't have to go to work. No one's forcing <laughs> you to go to work, right? That is me taking self-ownership literally. Now, it, obviously, we live in a society, and 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 there, there are reasons why I might, it might be in my best interest to go to work on Monday morning, but... No one, the, the principle of self ownership asserts that no one has the right to make you do anything. No one, no one has the right to make you go to work there. You are the exclusive controller of your own body and life, right? So, uh, the other principle that voluntarism is backed by, right, is the non aggression principle. Um, this, shortened as the NAP, is a concept uh, in which the assertion is made that aggression, right, defined as initiating or threatening any forceful interference with any individual or their property, is inherently wrong, right? So, so to take a step back from that, that's literally saying, right, don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. I, and I, and I, this isn't a hard concept, right, to to agree on. I think Jack and I can both agree that you know it's it's bad to hurt someone or take their stuff. So don't do it. Yeah, totally. Totally. So, so if, if we if we lay it out by that, we say, okay, so no one can make you, force you to do anything, and no one can hurt you or take your stuff, right? We we kind of come to the conclusion that we live in a in a somewhat voluntarist society, right? We're to some degree, right? We we all believe those principles and can all relate to them. Now, there's there's a lot layered on top of that 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 we're not going to go into, but those are the two basic principles that we're coming at as far as, as freedom is concerned, right? So, so if we take a look and, and say, why do we value freedom, right? Well, you get into the concept of if nobody can hurt you or take your stuff, right? What kind of rights do you have? Well, there's, there's a concept in philosophy called negative and positive rights. And you might have gone through this if you went over any, any kind of, uh, political philosophy course, right? Where where you talk about negative and positive rights. Positive rights are rights that you have on someone to do something for you, and negative rights are rights that you have against people doing stuff to you, right? Uh, voluntarism would say that only negative rights are valid in that you have a right for people not to hurt you and take your stuff, right? The same way that I don't have a right to hurt someone or take their stuff, right? Sure. Now, it, it can get a little complicated, especially in today's society. Well, do you have a right to force someone to provide you a good or service, right? On the face of it, you would say no, right? Well, let's take into consider uh, consideration e- education, right? Or, or, or health care, right? Or uh, redistribution of wealth in the form of taxation, right? So those are very... Uh, heated topics, obviously, that I'm not going to touch, you know, with a 29 and a half foot pole here, but <laughs> just be aware that that involuntarism, the the ideal is all right. Well, we don't we don't hurt people, we don't take their stuff, we don't impose upon others, right? Imposing upon others would be aggressing against self ownership, which once again is the ability to be the exclusive controller over one's own body and life. Right. If, if you don't have that, you don't have self-ownership. If someone is using coercion to force you to give them something they believe they deserve, right, that goes against the principle of self-ownership. But I, I think, you know, at the at the base of it, right, and, and the ideal that we're all kind of working towards here is, right, I, I think as a society, we're all better off if we don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. Like, I, totally. I think we can all agree on that. Um, but we I think we can all agree on that. So, so taking that and moving it, moving that understanding of freedom where we, we own ourselves and our bodies and the product of our labor and that we don't aggress against others or their property, let's take a look at the, the actual word freedom in, in the English language, right? There's the ambiguity of the word free. So there are two meanings that the word free or, or, or freedom in English is used to represent, right? So it's, it's one of two meanings, either for free, which would be the word gratis, and with little or no restriction, so the word libre, or libra. 
Uh, this ambiguity of free can cause issues where the distinction is important, as it often is in dealing with laws concerning the use of information, such as copyright and patents. Gratis, uh, the definition here would be uh, free in the sense that some goods or service is supplied without need for payment, even though it may have value. Libra, to expand on that definition, would be the state of being free, as in liberty or having freedom. Now, the classic way to draw the distinction between the two, or, or to draw a, a picture of this distinction between the two, is to say free as in beer, or free as in speech. Because we, we can kind of understand that free as in speech, you have the freedom to speak what you need to to speak. I mean, we, we kind of colloquially understand the the term free as in speech, the, the, the freedom to speak what, what you need to speak. And that doesn't actually come as a sense of, of value, right? That's that's not a good or a service like as would be free as in beer, right? So that's that's an actual right. tangible good that you're being sold um, or, or given, right, without a need for payment, even though it may have value, right? So, so when we talk about the word free, we're actually talking about one of two, two meanings of it, either either gratis, right, which is the more commonly understood way that 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 free is used. That's how we offer first month of our compose is free, is exactly. Free. Right. Um, but on the back end, we're using free software. Now, there is a yep. lot of lot of history behind the distinction between free software and open source software, as well as what does it actually mean for software to be free. Back in the day, Richard Stallman wrote about the four freedoms. Um, and the four freedoms he goes on and on and on and on about in his, his uh, post in the uh, GNU philosophy page here that's that's linked in the show notes. Uh, the four essential freedoms are as follows. The freedom to run the program as you wish for any purpose. And and keep in mind, this is specifically regarding software. So this, this will be software specific. Uh, the second freedom is the freedom to study how the program works and change it so it does your computing as you wish. Uh, access to the source code is actually a precondition for this. So we can we can almost roll having access to the source code, it being quote unquote open source, into the second freedom. Uh, the third one is the freedom to redistribute copies so you can help others. This comes in the legal sphere when we start talking about free and open source software. Well, you know what what can you do with it, right? He he lays out here the freedom to redistribute copies. Not only that, though, but his fourth freedom is, is very similar. His fourth freedom is that you have to have the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to others. Right. So by doing this, you can give the whole community a chance to benefit from your changes and access, once again, to the source code is a precondition for this. So Stallman not only lays out that you need to have the freedom in order for it to be considered free software. You have to have the freedom for the software to be redistributed so that you can help others, but also have your modified versions redistributed. Um, yeah. I am by no means going to go into a copyright or license or licensing. copyleft <laughs> discussion here. Yeah, licensing is is a whole nother beast. Oh my um, gosh. And Jack, if I'm not mistaken, you actually gave a talk on this to Open Source Club at OSU. I did back uh, two years ago, I think it would have been now. Yeah. Uh, I, I gave one on licensing and every, all the licenses that are out there and everything that's available. A lot of what we do is MIT. That's that's where I'll leave it at, which is almost as, uh, what do you want to call it, gratis, free as it gets. And there are many licenses like that that will respect or not respect uh, one or more of these freedoms, right, as they see fit, right? So, so there are licensings that fully comply with this, and there are licenses that only partially comply with this. And mm. they all have their reasons, and they all have their rationale as to why they think their solution around this definition of freedom is the best, and, and 
you know, it's it's obviously a huge point of contention, especially from the uh, GNU Public License version two to version three. I mean, there was we, a totally. there's a huge contention. There's there's code that you know still refuses to be released under the version three license. For instance, the Linux kernel. For I can guarantee you, for as long as Linus Torvalds is around, will be issued under a GNU version two license. Two. This list here, the Richard Selman's Four Freedoms, has sparked more contention over the definition of free software than I think anything else in the history has. Uh, but but I think he lays it out here uh, as to what he believes the you should have the freedom to be in, in order to be considered free software. And true to form, GNU, the, the, the project itself, does only recognize those those products as free and open source if they conform to all four of these points. And Definitely. Richard Tillman, of course, being the nerd he is, uh, numbers them in zero index. Zero, so yeah. <laughs> freedom zero, freedom one, freedom two, and freedom three. Now, this is this is all about software. Uh, and, and I kind of want to transition into something that has been integral to, to me growing up, and, and, and that's obviously the availability of, of information writ large. Right, so, so there is so much floating out there, um, especially with the start of, of piracy, right? Uh, the start of st- streaming services, uh, and and trying to, to figure out what people mean by free. So, Stuart Brand has a often misquoted phrase here, where in a conference, a hackers conference back in 1984, uh, interesting year, he was quoted as saying, on the one hand, information wants to be expensive because it's so valuable. The right information in the right place just changes your life. On the other hand, information wants to be free because the cost of getting it out is getting lower and lower all the time. So you have these two fighting against each other. I think that's held true as technology has progressed. There's nothing that has necessarily debunked that that statement right uh, an, another way to to phrase it more succinctly would be, be that information wants to be free information also wants to be expensive that tension will not go away and yeah no I, absolutely there's 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 a there's the idea of you know if if you're streaming something you don't necessarily own that right you, you it's it, it's free but it's it's put on by a curation company and and i'd say for the right. past two decades i mean in information at this point in its most valuable form is curated you you talk about mailing lists you talk about in our case podcasts uh yeah. or or even uh social media i mean what what you're trying to do is you're tr- you're spreading information Right now, that information is is curated, and it comes as a cost to you. And keep in mind, in the open source world, we're not necessarily talking about a, a cost in in dollars. Right? We there's there's also a, a huge value sink in the amount of time that you're willing to spend on either a project or or learning about something or or going deeper into something. You're you're spending that at the cost of spending that time on Some, anything else. Right. Right. So. So there is there is definitely a cost to value, and if someone's providing you curation, right? If they're if they're sifting through, if they're spending their time sifting through everything else, they're going to be giving you value if they release that information, right? Or if they put their own spin on information that otherwise is is open source. Now the question becomes: Is that worth paying for? Right. I mean, what what do you necessarily what is that necessarily valued at if someone collects something or curates something or or adds their unique spin on it? You know, you've seen news outlets, you know, become antique dinosaurs within the past decade just based on on the practices that that they're going through. It's it's just not sustainable. And and you have the rise of of uh, the the ad market, right, be, because of this, because information wants to be free and it also wants to be expensive, right? The the only solution thus far that's necessarily been kind of happened upon is is just this bombardment of advertising, and and one would be hard to argue the 
the value that creates or, or even takes away from society, right? If, if it is a, a net positive or negative, and, and that's not for me to say right now, right? But that is the, the most general solution to the problem that Stuart Brand postulated in that information wants to be free, but on the other hand, it also wants to be expensive. How, how do you justify the two? And, and obviously there are other solutions uh, in place. Uh, one of the, the things that, that we believe is that uh, there is a, a lot of, of tangible value that needs to be uh, used in, in order to, to bring services to bear. I mean, the, what we're running our Compose on ultimately ends up being server hours. Right, we we use compute, we use disk, we use RAM. Right, I mean that's that's tangible goods, you know, that are being consumed by the 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 free and open source software. Well, it's it's only free up until the software point. You know, you you can't necessarily argue that that translates all the way down through the stack to the hardware and the electricity right, right. and and all that. Right. right? That is that is not covered by the GNU public license or the MIT license, you know, not 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 at all. So, I I think this dichotomy with information about it wanting to be free and expensive uh, is, you know, if not stayed the same, it's it's become even more relevant, right? Uh, especially in the age where all we have is access to the information that's that's flowing to us into our homes. Right. right. So how how we solve that going forward, you know, currently it's an ad based uh, system. I I am very excited to see where it goes. I have my own ideas and my own own thoughts about what I want to create in order to, to give solutions to that that very same problem. But it's it's not one that's easily solved, and and I don't think it necessarily will ever be solved. It'll it'll only be mitigated. So keeping that in mind. We've made the decision to run open, free and open source software, uh, Floss, free Libra and open source software, right? Now, where it becomes important, well, it became important, was back in, especially the 90s, um, when free and open source software was kind of coming to a forefront, and people were wondering... Uh, is this secure, right? Uh, how can they be giving stuff for free? Is this socialism? Yeah, and, and, and trying to figure out where exactly was free software and open source. And there were, there were two main camps uh, in the English-speaking world uh, where, where software was to be known in, by one of two names, either free software or open source software. Uh, broadly speaking, uh, goes Digital Ocean's tutorial, both terms refer to the same thing, software with few restrictions on how it can be used. From the perspective of the proponents, both free and open source software are safer, more efficient, and work more reliably than their proprietary counterparts. And, and Jack, I think you and I are, are definitely in this camp. Yeah. Yep. Uh, why though do we have labels for two of the same thing? Why why do can't why do we not have one cohesive phrase uh, to to refer oh, to this by? If only uh, and, that easy. <laughs> and this is this is obviously way too long to go over. I mean it it dives into the GNU manifesto, uh, talks about the the Free Software Foundation and and the Open Source Initiative, and if none of those were recognizable to you, I would highly, highly recommend you follow the link in the show notes to the Digital Ocean tutorial on free versus open source software and get to know a little bit of the history on what you're using and, and what open source software means as a, a both a movement and a practical resource, right? The, the conclusion uh, of the, the article, though, is that the terms free software and open source software are interchangeable for most context, and whether someone prefers one over the other usually comes down to a matter of semantics or their philosophical outlook. That is the reason why, at the beginning here, I, I, I explained the acronym FLOSS, right? Free, Libra, and Open Source Software, right? I believe that that acronym kind of hits all of the main points, 
and uh, you can you can yeah. really kind of go off in into the weeds on on any one of them. You can branch off and and really hammer any of those points home. Whether it's the free software, whether you know free as in beer, right? Libra, whether it's free as in speech, open source, where you can view the source, right? It being a prerequisite for the four freedoms. So I I just think it's a it's a great acronym that kind of embodies all of that, and that is why I will use that acronym in conversations about free Libra and open source software. Yeah. So on the heels of that discussion, I wanted to bring up a change to the R compose suite of tools. So we are retiring the manager software from our suite of tools. Now uh, to, to quote a post on the, the forum manager is not open source software. Just because the desktop edition is free, free as in beer, free as in gratis, does not make the software open source, right? So this is this is put very succinctly. Uh, I, I link to the the blog post or the forum post uh, in the show notes uh, by one of the moderators. I mean, it's it's just called out explicitly. It's freeware. End of the day. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to pay for the upgrade on the subscription. You can't get any of the source code. It's hard to maintain. As someone who wants to look at the code and the internals of how it works, and that's what we usually do, we customize a lot of these software, pro- you know, open source projects. We're not able to do that with Manager, so we taken it out of our list of products here. Yeah, as a as a practical point, yeah, we we cannot inspect the sources as we need to in order to understand the workings of of how it does what it what it needs to do. You know, it's, there's and and there is. Absolutely a community around it, but not a community that was focused on improving it, right? A community that's focused on using it, which is which is fine. And, and I'm not saying it's bad software either. I, I really do appreciate everything that it brings to the table, and, and I really do like how it works. And uh, if it were to go open source in the future, I would jump on that in a heartbeat, right? Absolutely. However, uh, due to the, the practical uh, implications that Jack brought up as, as well as the philosophical ones that we've gone over, right? And, and that Jack and I both believe it provides a safer, more efficient and more reliable uh, basis on which to build software, right? And, and it, manager, unfortunately, just does not subscribe to that, that ethos. Uh, so we're, we going forward from stable 2.5 will not be offering it. Uh, as a service that we provide. Right. So uh, I have links to the, the pull requests here to remove manager from the, the role and the rest of the playbooks and, and scripts. And uh, yep. that, will be, that will be put into the stable 2.5 branch. Uh, however, uh, I did want to, to tease one of the services that we are looking heavily into, uh, which is accounting, um, spelled awkwardly A K A U N T I N G <laughs> for some reason, but I I think it just hit what was that two years old? Um, and when Jack and I started this, it was it was a brand new application that didn't have near as many features as it does now, um, or 2.0. Excuse me, it hit it hit 2.0. So I think I think we're ready to take another look at this. Uh, cause there are some really cool things that it brings to the table. W- one of the, one of the things that it attempts to do to solve the quote unquote information wants to be free problem is it offers, uh, associated applications like plugins and add-ons, uh, for a fee, like to, to maintain those, to keep those, uh, up to date and whatnot. Uh, so that's, that's a very interesting revenue model, right? And I, I'd, be excited to explore that to see how that can work with, with what we provide, uh, and and I hope to see more of that in the future. To to kind of drive this home, right? As compositional enterprises, we value our time as much as you do, right? That's why we use the best free Libra and open source tools to produce our quality content and products. I want you to take action and start using the same secure and convenient tools that we use by signing up for your R Compose instance today. We had that linked in the show notes there. It is available. It is ready to you. We are in alpha now. We're we're ready to go here. Uh, You can also invest in your community by donating directly to this podcast. Every bit and every bite goes back into growing and spreading the show. Otherwise, 
To stay updated with the show and all future developments, you can find us on Locals.com or you can sign up for our mailing list at the bottom of the show notes. So I wanted to thank everyone who follows the show. That ensures that we continue to produce this and this service and these episodes and spread the word and, and get it out there. So we hope you enjoyed this episode of our Composecast. Thank you, be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks.